So we're all familiar with talk of injustice. What is epistemic injustice? Well, each of us at times have knowledge, understanding, rational beliefs. We can give and receive knowledge, but we depend on others to treat us fairly in this process. Knowledge, giving and receipt is a social process. Um, cases of epistemic injustice are cases where we're treated unfairly or unjustly in this process of giving or receiving knowledge. One way this is put in the philosophy literature is that we're wronged in our capacity as knowers. Uh, one type of epistemic injustice has been um, identified by Miranda Fricker and labelled testimonial injustice. Testimonial injustice occurs when the testimony of a person is given less credibility than it deserves due to a stereotype about the person's group. For example, the stereotype that women depend on intuition or black people are athletic, not intelligent, or the stereotype that people with mental health issues are just crazy. Um, Fricker gives the example of um, Marge from the talented Mr. Ripley. Um, her husband has gone missing and she has suspicions about Mr. Ripley's involvement in, um, in this event. Um, she tries to express this suspicion and she's dismissed on the basis that she's just making the judgement on mere women's intuition. So here you've got a stereotype that's applied and a person's testimony isn't given the credibility that it deserves because you know she is in a good position to know about her husband and his situation and his going missing. So stereotypes often favour people in positions of power, leading to the maintenance of existing social struct structures. It's worth noting though that Marge is in a privileged position. So the example that Fricker uses is this one of this privileged person, but some women are put in social positions in which they're not given the opportunity to voice opinions about various issues. So um, one example that's given by Patricia Hill Collins is black women who are placed in the positions as domestic servants, denied educational opportunities. They're put in a social situation in which they're really deprived in terms of the opportunity to give and receive knowledge and to be given the, the credibility that they deserve in that process. It's worth noting as well, and this is another thing that Hill Collins has noted, that those people who occupy positions that are less privileged often get various insights as a result. So, um, for example, the domestic servant living in the house of a uh, white family who are landowners might get an insight into the inconsist inconsistencies and oppositions found in the ideologies of those individuals. Um, she might see that um, women in the household are treated as if they can't do certain work, and yet she, as a woman, because she's black, is treated as if she can do that work. So it's possible to get insights um, through being the, a part of this group that's less privileged that members of the more privileged group can't have. Um, but as a result of the lack of credibility given to the less privileged people, um, there can be a general ignorance about these insights that they gain because they're not listened to and they're not given the credibility that they deserve. Okay, so that's one of the difficult um, concepts that's been introduced by Fricka. Another one is hermeneutical injustice. Um, she points out that members of stigmatised and marginalised groups can be denied access to resources that they need to understand their own experiences. For example, they can lack conceptual resources. And this is as a result of the way that society is structured. So um, Fricka talks about sexual harassment. Obviously, there's been a lot of talk in the news recently about sexual harassment, but she discusses a time when this concept wasn't even heard of. And she discusses how people had experiences in the workplace that they were aware of but they couldn't articulate to other people because there were not the conceptual resources out there to talk about sexual harassment. Another example would be postnatal depression. Um, people who don't have this concept will not, not be able to understand and articulate their experiences. So they will be put in a less privileged position um, as a result of the lack of conceptual resources available within their society. Fricker argues that this can cause confusion and isolation and the loss of confidence of an, a person in their ability to articulate their experiences. It's important to distinguish two things here though. It's important to distinguish a lack of conceptual resources within the person who has the experience and a lack of conceptual resources within other people. So it's been argued recently in response to Fricker that Members of stigmatised and marginalised groups often have a good understanding of their own experiences and the problems that they face are in articulating those experiences to other people who lack the conceptual resources because they haven't had this shared experience. 
So it's possible for members of groups to have an own, their own understanding but not be able to explain those experiences to other people due to the way society is structured and the way that those other people therefore lack conceptual resources. Okay, so then another type of um, epistemic injustice is testimonial silencing. And this is something that's been discussed by Christy Dotson. So this can come in two forms. Testimonial quieting happens when an audience fails to identify the speaker as a knower. So uh, once again, she talks about black women because um, this is her, her area of research. And she focuses on how black women are often identified as not being knowers because of the stereotypes associated with them. And then as a result of this, when they try to speak and articulate their experiences or other information, other people can fail to take in their testimony and um, respond appropriately to it. And this can be, again, as a result of a false stereotype, the false stereotype that black women are not knowers. This can damage the intellectual courage of individuals who are systematically silenced. And where a whole, all of the members of a certain group are silenced in this way, it can be that the knowledge that they have within that group, they've developed within that group, for example, within their intellectual traditions is lost. It's lost to other people because they're not able to articulate it and have that information received by other people. Okay, so that's testimonial quieting. But there's another form of testimonial silencing that Dotson discusses, and this is testimonial smothering. So this is where a speaker self-silences because she believes that her testimony will be misinterpreted. So in any individual case, it might not be that someone else has acted in a way that suggests that they're not going to be listened to, but they can assume based on their past experiences that the other person isn't going to take up their testimony in the way they should. So a person can avoid being misinterpreted in a situation by just staying silent. Dotson talks about black domestic violence victims in the United States who might be reluctant to speak up because they don't want to, um, by explaining their experiences, um, seem to provide support for the stereotype that black men are violent. Okay? In this situation, they're denied the opportunity to explain their experience due to other people's lack of willingness or ability to properly understand their experience and put it in context. Right, so, um, those are some ways that um, epistemic injustice can manifest. But it's worth noticing that this can be willful or unintentional. So, epistemic injustice can be willful and intentionally chosen or unintentional. So, at the one extreme, you might have a sexual harasser who intentionally um, undermines the person that they've harassed, explicitly using stereotypes about them in order to undermine them and undermine the claims that they make. Um, given the recent news, it's easy to imagine examples like this. So someone might be labelled um, a slut, they might be stereotyped in such a way that their previous sexual history seems to be relevant to an event where it isn't. And this can be done in order to undermine their claims of sexual harassment against someone else. Um, so this could be a case where someone intentionally and consciously chooses to engage in epistemic injustice to undermine someone in their capacity as a, a, a knower and someone who can give and receive knowledge. But at the other extreme, a person might just display subtle behaviours, for example, avoiding eye contact, suggesting that they don't trust someone else due to the operation of implicit bias, and this could lead to testimonial smothering. So there are empirical findings suggesting that implicit bias can lead people to do things like avoid eye contact with members of certain groups. Um, and that sort of behaviour can suggest to the person whose uh, eye contact is being avoided that they're not going to be trusted or listened to. And as a result of that, they could end up choosing not to speak because they might judge that their audience is not receptive. So then you could have something like an implicit bias that is unintentional, um, not chosen, leading to a form of epistemic injustice in testimonial smothering. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you.